Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches keeps the butterflies happy with some native milkweeds. OSU plant disease diagnostician Jen Olson identifies powdery mildew on squash plants. We get an update on Casey's raised bed vegetable garden and Justin Moss, professor and head of the OSU Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture, electrifies lawn care with some battery-powered tools. You're probably familiar with the green antelope horn milkweed that is abundant along our roadsides this time of year. But there's a lot of native milkweeds that are supporting the migration of monarch butterflies. And there's two I want to introduce you to. This one is Asclepius tuberosa. This is also called butterfly weed. And you can see if you have noticed it on the side of the road with these bright orange flowers, it's definitely going to grab your attention as well as the monarchs. A lot of times we think milkweeds produce those uh, milky sap when the leaves are broken, but this particular milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa, doesn't actually produce that milky sap. So you don't have to worry about it irritating your skin. Also, Asclepia tuberosa does prefer dry soils. While the majority of a butterfly milkweed has these bright, almost construction orange flowers, you might on occasion see a yellow flowering one. And in fact, there is a cultivar on the uh, market called Hello Yellow that has yellow flowers also that you can purchase. Now this particular milkweed can be slow to germinate in the spring so be patient with it um, but it is easy to germinate from seed so if you want to collect those uh, fuzzy silk like seeds you can do that. Um, it might take a couple of years to really establish itself to bloom though so be patient with it. The other thing is, is if you see it in the native um, areas, make sure that you don't dig this one up because like many of our native uh, wildflowers, it has a very long, deep tap root. And so you're likely not going to be able to transplant it. But this is a really good milkweed to have in your garden. And then we have another one here behind us. Now, if you're looking for an Asclepius that's really gonna provide a lot of forage for those monarch caterpillars, you can't beat the common milkweed that we have here in front of us. Now, in a garden setting, this plant can get up to eight feet tall, but in the native areas, it probably is gonna get to be about three to four feet tall. You can see it has plenty of vegetation on it with these eight inch long, um, sort of velvety leaves to it that are opposite and they, continue to go up as the stem grows. Also, it will bloom a kind of a rosy pink flower that um, starts out in the axis of each of those leaf uh, buds. With these flowers, the, this Asclepius not only provides good forage for the uh, larval caterpillars, but it also will provide nectar for the butterflies as they continue their migration. Now these flowers, once they start to mature, they're gonna develop into a warty seed pod and you can harvest those silky seeds. Again, they're easy to germinate. But once you've established this plant in your garden, you're gonna find that it really will spread and colonize the areas more by rhizomes. In addition to the green antelope horn, these are also two great native Asclepias that you might wanna think about adding to your garden in order to help those monarchs that are migrating through Oklahoma. One of my biggest problems that I have in my landscape is a disease called powdery mildew. And I see it on lots of different plants in the landscape. And a lot of that has to do with uh, my children play in the sprinkler quite a bit. 
Powdery mildew is a little bit different than some other fungal diseases because you don't just, you don't need free moisture on the leaves. You can have powdery mildew with just a little bit of humidity in the air. So if I see it earlier in the season, it's something that I'm gonna be dealing with throughout the summer. It actually almost becomes more aggressive when the temperatures warm up. I've noticed that on my squash and cucumbers, I'm already starting to see powdery mildew. And so I wanna go ahead and take some action so that we'll have a good crop. Uh, powdery mildew doesn't usually kill the plant, but it reduces photosynthesis because it looks like powder is obscuring, uh, been sprinkled on those leaves and it's preventing as much photosynthesis as you would normally get. So you get reduced yields. With powdery mildew, there's a lot of things that you can do just culturally to reduce the level of disease. Number one, try not to run the sprinkler all the time. Uh, since I can't do that, the next step I'm going to take is to try to remove it when I see it. So I'm going to pick off the leaves that are showing that fungus. The next step is promoting good air circulation. So with squash, a lot of times those leaves that are lower on the plant aren't getting as much sunlight and they tend to be weaker and that's usually where you see the powdery mildew first. So I'm simply just, when I see a leaf starting to discolor a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and remove it and throw it away. You can also, if you have a lot of leaves on top of each other, just do some thinning. Remove some of those leaves so that you have better airflow. It's also gonna expose the blooms a little bit more so that pollinators can get in there more effectively. Um, another issue that <laughs> we have here is it's important to remember to properly plant your plants. The squash is doing well, but I have a cucumber uh, that's also showing evidence of powdery mildew, and this should have been trellised. Uh, we had good intentions, it just hasn't happened yet, and so part of the reason why there's a lot of these little powdery spots is it's a lot more humid and wet near the ground, so there's a lot more disease pressure. Once I get this up on the stake, or we're actually gonna put a little trellis up here, then we're gonna see a lot less of the disease. And our goal, really focus on that new growth, make sure that it's coming out healthy. One thing to mention at the beginning of the season, it's a little late now, but there is a lot of resistance to powdery mildew and other diseases in both seeds and transplants. So if you've had a problem with a disease like this in the past, take a little bit of time to figure out if what you're purchasing has resistance. Um, resistance is an immunity, but it, it is good tolerance and usually you can still get a good crop in the presence of disease. Uh, one thing I will mention is that sometimes we want, might want to spray fungicides. One of the best fungicides to control powdery mildew is sulfur. And it's great for plants like roses and fruit trees, but it's actually not labeled for vegetables such as squash and cucumbers. And the reason for that, it can actually burn and damage your plants. So you don't wanna apply sulfur to these plants. As an alternative, a good product to use is something that contains an oil. Um, so when you spray that oil on the plants, it actually kind of burns up the fungus. So it can almost have a little bit of a curative ability. And there's a lot of formulations of oils that are organic, so it tends to be suitable in most landscapes, especially since we have pollinators flying around. You wanna make sure you're doing those applications when those pollinators aren't present. And as it does get hotter in the summer, those oils, once you get into the mid 90s, can actually burn plants too. So you may have to hold off on those applications during hot weather periods. Most of the time in our landscape, we're able to manage powdery mildew and still get a good crop just with the cultural methods, but you have a little bit of information about chemicals if you do need to go that route.
update on our home garden situation here and let you all know, as you can see, things have really taken off since we were out here last and we started planting some of our transplants and our seeds. So um, there has been uh, some successes and some problems that I want to share with you all. Um, unfortunately, whenever you're gardening, you can't control 100% of the environment all of the time. And so what you're seeing on our tomatoes, um, and it's often a problem around April through June, is um, some sort of herbicide drift. And so if you take a look at these tomatoes, you can see that the um, petiole or the stem to the leaf is sort of twisting. There's some cupping on the leaves and things like that. Um, now we are getting some flowers and we do have a few green tomatoes on here. So um, we'll kind of see if these will grow out of it. Um, they might, we've got a long season to go. So I'm gonna keep an eye on our tomatoes. Now we do know that's herbicide damage because we're seeing it not just on tomatoes, but on some of the other plants. Tomatoes are one of the most susceptible um, to herbicide drift. And again, this can happen in neighborhoods, anywhere. Um, 2,4-D is one of the common herbicides that tends to drift more than some of the others. Uh, and dicamba as well is, is one. Um, but you see a little bit on the peppers here. Um, we've got a little bit of the, the leaves are kind of thickened a little bit and they're kind of stretched and twisted. Not so bad on the peppers. A um, little bit on some cosmos seeds that I threw out here. I like to incorporate just a few flowers in my vegetable garden so I've done that here. Um, but I think they'll be fine. They're not too much of a concern. We've got some Armenian yard long cucumbers growing on the north side here of our pepper or excuse me of our tomato trellis. They're starting to flower, but we don't have any cucumbers on those just yet. If we go down here a little ways, I've got some more tomatoes, and these are some of our bigger tomatoes. Um, and I want to point out what I thought was kind of one that was uh, slow to grow and it was shorter. It actually um, fared better uh, from that herbicide damage, so it looks like it's going to be fine. You can see the others that were a little bit larger uh, got hit a little bit more. And then some critter came in and decided to take a bite out of some of those on the end there. So I'm not sure what it was. Uh, got a couple armadillos and things like that around here. Um, but usually they're looking for grubs. So you might remember we planted some Black Beauty uh, a zucchini here. Um, and this is what has come. So far, knock on wood, we don't have any squash bugs just yet, but we're continuing to scout for those by turning over any of the leaves, especially the lower leaves. You'll start to see um, a cluster of eggs um, or you might just see some damage, but we're on the lookout for that, but so far we have not seen any. Now you can see that I planted these earlier than I planted the yellow squash. So these are actually much further along. Um, and if you come down here, I want to show you the difference between some of the flowers. We've talked about this before, but if you're in a home garden situation and you're new to this, you might see different types of flowers and be wondering why you're not getting fruit yet. So right here, this flower is a male flower. Um, you can see that it has a nice smooth stem that goes up to the flower here. Now you can utilize these. These are great for um, fried squash blossoms if you want to. Um, but behind us, let's see if I can find a female. The females are the ones that are gonna have swollen uh, ovaries below the flower buds. So actually here's one right here that's not yet bloomed that's will bloom. You can see that bud, but do you see how that's kind of a swollen area below that? So that will eventually, once it's pollinated um, by the bees and stuff, that will develop into what will be your zucchini squash. So right here we've got one that is starting to develop into that squash. You can see it's still blooming. Um, down here we've had one that will continue to grow and develop. So that's that might be why if you're seeing these, the male flowers tend to come on before the female flowers. So if you're seeing those flowers and wondering why you're not getting fruit yet, that might be, you might take a look and see if they're male flowers that are coming on. A lot of times the male flowers will come on to get those pollinators um, excited to start visiting that plant. Now you might remember we planted some uh, 
asparagus. We planted six rhizomes of asparagus. We planted three over here, which I also just see to some bachelor buttons. Um, they're doing well, they're all coming up. Over here we've got three more. You can see the asparagus are coming up. We're not really doing anything to them right now. We're just letting them grow. Um, asparagus harvesting season is over. Um, the first year when you plant them, you don't wanna harvest anything anyway. We're just really trying to get that root to develop. So we want that fern to grow and photosynthesize to really get a larger root system. Now in front of us here, we have some potatoes. Again, a member of the Solanaceae family. Um, and you can see we've got some, again, herbicide damage done to them with the twisting of the leaves. They're very coarse. So um, I don't have anything really to lose by letting them stay and see if they grow out. We'll see what we can harvest. It's probably going to um, affect uh, the number of potatoes and the size of potatoes I get, but we're going to go ahead and keep them in here and, and uh, watch them and harvest them in June and see what they look like. Another plant that's also in the Solanaceae family and is very sensitive to uh, herbicide damage is the eggplant, and you can see that there's some cupping that's happening on those leaves. So on the north side of our potatoes here, um, I planted a few, uh, another squash. This is a bossa nova squash, um, which is an All-America selection. Um, you can see that it's kind of got a unique pattern to it. I've already been able to harvest a couple off of these. And that's likely because we started this as a transplant um, and put it straight out in the garden. The others I started as seed, so they took a little bit longer. So I'm already getting fruit off of something that was a transplant in the garden versus a seed. So, um, but even though squash is very easy to start from seed. Of all the squash plants that we started from seed, um, our yellow straight neck, we actually planted a couple of weeks later than our black beauty uh, zucchinis. And so you can see that these yellow squash are a little bit smaller still, again, because they're a little bit delayed in how long they've been in the ground, but we are starting to get some fruit on it as well. Now, over here we have um, our trellis that we built. And we've got several cucumbers um, that I've kind of been training up on this a little bit. Uh, we've got a lot of flowers coming on and several cucumbers to go ahead and start picking. Um, you know, picking them depending on your, what you're going to do with them. If you're going to pickle them, you might want them smaller. If you're going to use them for slicing, you might want them a little bit bigger. So we have several uh, cucumbers in here. Um, and we'll have plenty more as we go through the summer months. Now just on the other side, it's time to harvest our onions also. So you can see our onions have sort of fallen over here. We do get a fair bit of wind and basically it's time to harvest these. Um, we've got both red and uh, yellow in here. I think maybe some whites is also. I like to harvest this. You're gonna wanna kind of brush off as much of the dirt as possible. And then I like to put them in these web trays just to kind of let them dry out a bit. So once I get these onions pulled, this also might be another place that I can do some more succession planting on my squash. So in case we do get some squash bugs coming in, I'll have some new plants ready to go. So really that's what's going on in a home garden um, in Oklahoma in May to June. You might see some uh, herbicide drift, but you should be harvesting your onions and starting to see some green tomatoes come on. I have some mowers here that I wanted to show you different features and really wanted to look at can I mow my yard using a battery operated mower so what I have here is a, a standard this one just happens to be a craftsman mower so this would be your standard gasoline uh, mower very nice this one happens to have a few features on it it's got a uh, uh, personal pace type setting so that actually the mower will just walk for you and you walk behind it and steer it so to speak and that's a really nice feature on a lot of mowers these days. Some have the gears on the front wheels, some have the gears on the back wheels. This one happens to have the gears on the back wheels. So if we switch over for a second, we look at, well, what if I wanted to mow my lawn using 
uh, battery operated mowers. Can you do that? Yes, you can. And so what I wanted to show you here is, is really a, uh, a more recent battery operated mower. And what's neat about this one is it has a lot, a lot of features. It does have a, uh, a battery that only works with this type of mower or this brand, so you have to be aware of that. But what's really nice about it is it does have the kind of the personal pace uh, feature on it such that you don't have to push it, but it, the battery is actually strong enough not just to spin the blades for you, but also to operate the mower with gears and move it forward for you so you just walk behind it. So that's a really nice feature on these. And it still has the power to mow the lawn for you, so that's very important. The other nice feature about these is they have these folding features. You can, you can take this and fold the handle and store it easily. It has a, uh, a, a feature where you just have one knob to raise and lower the mower, so that's very nice. And if you look at the difference between these two, this one, of course, has an engine and a steel frame, or this one, uh, it looks like it has an engine, but that's just where the battery goes. And then it has a plastic frame. So the advantage of that plastic frame, this is a very lightweight mower and easy to move around the yard. The disadvantage is it's going to be a little bit less durable if, you know, versus steel, right? Okay, so now if we move over to another brand of battery operated mower, still has all those features except this one, you have to push it yourself. This one's not going to run forward for you, doesn't have that feature. And uh, the difference though here is that it does have a steel type frame to it. So a little bit more durable on it, but it doesn't have the nice... Uh, features for you that, that you're going to have to actually push this one through the through the lawn. This one happens to operate off of uh, this brand's batteries and so if you have this brand's uh, other things like maybe drills or other power tools or blowers or what have you you can switch the batteries are interchangeable so that's a nice feature of this one. This one happens to take two batteries to operate. So if I were to fill up the old gas engine here to take a gas you know I could probably Average size lawn, I could probably mow it a couple times really easily on average size yard. With uh, some of these battery operated ones, I may only be able to mow one time and then I need to charge it back up before I mow again. It all depends on uh, the size of your yard. You may be able to get two mowings out of it, but certainly you got to remember to charge that battery up, but also you got to remember buy, buy gasoline for the other one. So what's nice about the battery operated ones is you can actually buy other things that work with it. So this is a battery operated weed eater here. It takes the same battery as the mower would and it just plugs right into the back here. So, so this trimmer uh, again is, is fairly lightweight because it doesn't have an engine on it. And so you, the battery does weigh a little bit but not quite as much as maybe an engine would. And what's really nice about this is it's, it's really powerful. And so uh, sometimes the disadvantage of these battery operated units is you just don't have the power to cut tall of vegetation. Well this one it does. It certainly does. Now here's another brand here that you can tell it's a little bit smaller and it actually takes a little bit smaller battery so it's more lightweight. Easy to carry around. However, it's not going to cut the vegetation, the tall vegetation maybe like some others would. That's just because it has a smaller battery, less power to it, but easier to hold and operate. It actually has features where you can put a wheel on this and turn it and use it to edge uh, your sidewalks or your driveway, things like that. So that's very nice. So just a couple more here. I wanted to show that you can use uh, the same type of battery to operate a blower. So this one is a very powerful battery operated blower and it will blow whatever you want it to blow. It's going to have that power to move uh, vegetation or clippings or what have you off the sidewalk or the driveway. Now this one is not battery operated but actually you would plug it in and it's very powerful. The disadvantage is you've, you've got uh, an extension cord trailing behind you at all times and so maybe it limits how far you can get out from the house. Same thing with some of those mowers. There, there are plug-in mowers out there still and of course it's, it's quite dangerous to have a cord trailing behind you when you have a rotary mower easy to get tangled up. Not that you can't do it safely but just something to be aware of. So here we go. We can use a gas-powered mower mower yard. Nowadays we have very nice battery operated mowers and they have beautiful nice cuts to them. So you can get the same quality of cut but maybe just doesn't go as far 
per charge, so you have to keep that in mind if you have a large yard. If you have a small, it's a medium-sized yard, these can fit quite nicely for you. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey compares Asian lilies and daylilies. We look in on a tomato variety trial. In Oklahoma City, we see how city and state agencies are working together with the Oklahoma City Community Foundation to prepare for emerald ash borer and strengthen the urban tree canopy. Casey has some early results in our Bermuda grass eradication study, and Barbara Brown has a tasty recipe. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.